this message this morning, amen. We, as always, would love to have the pastor here. I was thinking, as I was back in the back studying, I said, Lord, only if he were here today. But seeing that he's not, we endeavor to do our best to stand in his stead and preach the everlasting gospel. Amen. amen. Uh, if you would, take out your Bibles this morning. I'd like to invite your attention to the book of Genesis, chapter number 30. Everybody bring their Bible. Amen. Amen. No man goes for the robbery. You don't go to war without a gun, do you? That's right, brother. Amen. Amen. As saints, we don't go to battle without our sword. Right. Amen. Never walk in the church without a Bible. You never know what the preacher might say. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth, but a lot of these churches, you know, they just trust that you just know. A lot of people just go on along with whatever saying that people go up and they say, you know, the Bible said, the Bible don't say nothing like that. You know what the Bible said? Doing that? No, the Bible said, uh, God help those who help themselves. The Bible don't say that nowhere. Get your Bible, amen, and follow along so you can know just what God is saying, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, let us open them up. Genesis chapter number 30. And Sister Pam, if you would read verses 25 down through 27. Amen. And again, you came to pass. Yes. When Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go into my own place and to my country. Mm -hmm. Give me my wives and my children, whom I have served me, and let me go. For thou knowest my service, which I have done. And Laban said to him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Amen. Amen. Verse number 27, one more time, and we'll take our thought from that verse. And Laban said unto him, Laban said unto him, I pray thee, I pray thee, if I have found if I have favor, in thine, favor eyes, in thine eyes, tarry, tarry for I have learned for I have by learned experience, by experience Uh, that letter clause, amen, it says, for I have learned by experience. I thought this morning, saints, just for a little while, I have learned by experience. It's one thing to have somebody tell you something, amen. but it's another thing for you to experience it amen. for yourself. Isn't that right? Amen. Now, I can tell you about a particular restaurant, and I can say, man, they got the best prime rib in all of me. And man, I can describe it as succulent, as juicy, and just a little tinge of pink on the inside. And, and they got this all just gravy put on to all. Oh, it's so good. But until you taste it for yourself, until you experience, you really just don't know how good it is. Amen. You can read a book about going to a faraway place. Maybe the British West Indies, maybe Jamaica, or maybe the Cayman Islands. The pastor may come back and talk about how beautiful it is, and the white sand, and the blue water, and the dolphins swimming, and, and all of that. But unless you go there for yourself, right. unless you experience it for yourself, you will never really know. Amen. This morning we talked a little bit about I've learned some things by experience. Now, Laban here had learned some things. Isn't that right? He had Jacob with him for about 20 years. And during that 20 years, he did nothing but prosper. He was nothing but blessed. Why? Because he had a man of God in his midst. See, people are blessed when they have you in their life, thank God. Because when you serve God, you're blessed. And so, therefore, everyone in your family is blessed, thank God. Why? Because you serve God. Amen. Laban said, please don't leave because Jacob, if you leave, you're going to take those blessings with you, amen. And I've gotten grown accustomed to those blessings. I've grown accustomed to the favor, amen. But he said, I've learned by experience that you're, I'm blessed because, Jacob, you're blessed, thank God. That's right, bro. When we're born, we know very little, isn't that right? That's right, bro. If anything at all. Not at all. We have to learn how to walk. We have to learn how to talk. We have to learn how to dress ourselves. A lot of things we have to learn. Isn't that right? There's only one thing that a newborn baby knows. And it, it's just amazing. A newborn baby knows how to eat. Do you know that when they take that baby and they put it to the chest, they don't have to teach the baby how to suck. You don't have to give it a lesson. Now, you have to teach the mother how to feed. But you don't have to teach the baby how to eat, my God. Saints of God, the same thing applies in a spiritual sense this morning. When a person gets saved, amen, they cry out for the word of God. They are hungry. They say, I want to eat. They say, Pastor, feed me. They say, word of God, feed me. They say, saints of God, feed me. Feed me, feed me. Why? Because I'm hungry. I'm a new convert, thank God. But even then, they still have to learn how to walk. They still have to learn how to talk, thank God. They still have to learn how to live their lives so that it is pleasing to God. I've learned some things, thanks to God. I was, as I was pondering this message, I said, Lord, I've 
saved coming close now to 18 years. I was in my teenage years. Thank God I got saved in my youth. Amen. If I get saved young, amen, the devil couldn't steal my youth. See, he stole from some folks' youth. Some of my friends, he stole not only their youth, but he stole their life. Some of my friends I grew up with, they're locked up in a prison house. They're not getting out anytime soon. And I can't even be able to count on both hands, my God, and feet too, how many of my friends have died this morning. Some died on the streets. Some overdose, some died in house fires, some died in shootouts with oh, police, my God. Yeah. Some died in prison, but yeah. they're gone. Oh. But I got saved at a young age, thank God. And during this time that I've been saved, I've learned some things. Yeah. How about you? In the yeah. time that you yeah. serve God, I'm quite yeah. sure that you've learned yeah. at least a few things, my God. Yeah. Now, I'm still learning, yeah. and there's still a whole lot that I have to learn. Yeah. But if I could this morning just uh, uh, hold your attention for a little while, as I want to share with you seven things that I've learned in my salvation. Seven things that I have learned. Now, there are other things, no doubt. But these seven things stand out in my mind this morning. And if I can share them with you, I pray that maybe you'll learn as well. And maybe some of you have already learned. But you'll be blessed. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to Proverbs 13 and verse 15. Now, at least one of these things, these seven things that we speak of this morning, there'll be a Bible verse for it. I don't believe in just preaching our mere opinion or idea. But everything is going to be what the Word of God says. What? Line upon line. Right, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Amen. We're going to establish the foundation for every word that we speak this morning. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 15. Good understanding give a favor. Good understanding give a favor. But the way of transgressors. But the way of transgressors is hard. I have learned this morning that when you are in sin, when you are not saved, it's a hard life. Now I had to learn that first and foremost. What? What I said at the time, I've learned by experience, thank God. I don't have anyone to tell me, well, look, son, don't do this and don't go here, don't do that. But I was the type of person I like to deal with that a little bit. Brother Robert Lady like said, you know, oh man, gonna try this reef. I said, well, let me try it. They said, oh, you're gonna try some ENT. I said, well, let me try it. You ought to come to the party, well, I'll come. Why? I wanted to try some things. I was the type of person I wanted to experience some things. But I wish somebody could have pulled my coattail. I wish somebody could have said, son, do you know where this road is leading? Do you see the end of the path that you're taking, my God? That this way is a hard way, my God. Dear ones, when you're not saying it's a hard life. I don't care, I'm, you may be religious, you may go to church, or whatever the case is, but as long as you're in sin, it's a hard life, my God. Because there's nothing that can shake the guilt. There's nothing that can shake the, my God, that troubled mind. When you go to bed at night, you know, if Jesus comes, you're on your way to hell, my God. There's nothing I can tell myself. I had went to the party, I had to have fun, I had to do this and that. I walked around with a smile plastered on my face. How you doing, my God? Oh, I'm good. Oh, I'm great, my God. I'm going real good down on the inside that I was nothing but. I was messed up. I was miserable. I was not happy. I had no peace of mind. I had no joy on the inside. It was not a happy life that I was living. No matter how much, see, we call it, I was front. Yeah. You know what that means, right? I was putting on a facade. I was trying to portray to the world that I was doing all right. I was trying to portray to my friends that I'm good. When my friends ever say, would ask me, man, look, why don't you come to church? I said, I don't need your church. Man, I'm happy right now. And I was sad and miserable and messed up, crying by my bedside every night. Lord, please don't come back tonight because, Lord, I know I'm not saved. I don't want to go to hell, Lord. But every night, every hour, the next day, very next night, I'm at the party again. I'm out with my friends again. We hang out, driving up and down the air. One more night, my God. Just a miserable life. The way of a transgressor is hard, my God. Young people, hear me this morning. The way of a sinner is hard. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the lights, my God. The glamour, the big rims, and the loud and the fancy car. Pockets full of money and all types of clothes, my God. And friends. It ain't nothing to that, my God. See, but the devil don't want you to know that sin is a two-sided coin. See, there's two sides to every coin. There's the heads and the tails. And that's how sin is, my God. You think, oh, I'm having fun, and, and this is good, and this is great, and, until you get the news that you got a baby coming. You're only 
14 years old. Until you get those handcuffs, click, click, behind your back and you're thrown in a patrol car, my God. Then you're only 16 years old and you got a record now. And a number that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. And you ain't going to be able to hardly get no job nowhere because you are a convicted felon, my God. Don't believe the devil, my God. You have this, I got this girl and that girl, and then one day you come from the health department and you find out you got the virus. See, sin is a two-sided coin, and you can go ahead and say it won't happen to me, and I can run down the list if you want of all the saints' children that it happened to them, my God. They sat up in these blue pews, and they sat there and said, well, I'm, I don't care what Mama said, I don't care what Pastor Paul said, and I don't care what Brother Bobby said, I don't care what Brother Hampton said, I'm going to do it my way. The Bible tells us the way of a transgressor is hard, my God. Oh, it's a hard life, my God. It's, it's a terrible life when you ain't and when you don't have God. Please, this morning, learn from me. See, sometimes you can learn from other folks' mistakes now. Isn't that right? See, you can learn from Brother Bobby's mistakes. You can learn to say, you know what? He messed up. God had mercy on him. But you don't have to mess up. All right? I've learned that the way of a transgressor is mighty hard, my God. Amen. Anyway, hey, let's turn to Jeremiah 31 and 3. For some of these scriptures this morning, we're going to have a couple readers because I have piggyback scriptures off of them. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. And Sister Linda, if you could get me Romans 8, 38. So this morning, the number one thing that we learned is that the way of a transgressor is a hard life. There's nothing more greater, saints of God, than when you can lay your head on your pillow at night and know that everything's all right. Yeah. One brother said somewhere sometime, he said, there's no pillow softer than a clear conscience. Yeah. To go to bed knowing that I'm right with God. All right. To go to bed knowing that I'm right with my, friend, my friends. Yeah. To go to bed knowing that I'm wrong. No man. Yeah. To go to bed knowing that I've been faithful to my wife. Yeah. To go to bed knowing that I have been a good father to my children. Yeah. To go to bed knowing that I have walked in a way that pleases I had 
God loved me. Amen. God didn't have to love me, but he did. Yes. And then follow me this morning. God loves you. I wrote down this thought, amen. God loved me in sin. He loves me when I'm weak. He loved, no, I'm sorry. He loves me when I'm strong. He loves me when I'm weak. He loves me all the day long. See, sometimes people get saved, and I've learned this too. And when they hit a few bumps in the road, and they have a few struggles, they think that God stopped loving them. Yes. What's the scripture yes. say, sister? Romans 8. Amen. And verse 38. Is that what I'm looking for? And 39. It says, For I am persuaded. For I am persuaded. That neither death. Neither death. Nor life. Nor life. Nor angels. Nor principalities. Nor powers. Nor things present. Nor things present. Or things to come. Nor height. Height. Nor death. Nor any other creature. Shall be able to separate me from the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then why let me tell you, if God loved you when you was messed up, if God loved you when you were nothing but a rank sinner, my God, just because you hit a bump in the road, you made a mistake, or you stumbled and fell, my God, that doesn't mean God stopped loving you. As a matter of fact, it's when we're weak that God loves us more, my God. Let's, let's approach this from a human perspective. If you have a family member that's down in their body, Maybe they're hospitalized. Maybe they can't do for themselves. That's when you what? You rally around them. Right? That's when your love even pours out more upon them. And you're by their bedside and you're washing their body and you're feeding them. Put a food in their mouth. Right? Because you love them, my God. When they're down, they need you the most. And that's when people step up to the challenge. Now let's look at it from a spiritual perspective. When we get down and we struggle, we have our challenges. The devil will love to tell you God that forgot about you. He will love to tell you that God don't love you no more. But look at how much nonsense that is. If God loved me when I was nothing but a sinner, then how can God stop loving me because I got a few struggles? How can God stop loving me because I tripped along the way, my God? How can God stop loving me because I, I hit a snag in the road, my God? Do we understand this morning, say to God, that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love? It reaches, my God, to the lowest valley. And from the lowest valley to the highest mountain, thank God, God's love can go. It reached me when I wasn't even thinking about God. Oh, there was a time in my life that I wasn't thinking nothing about God, but his love reached me. Someone gave me that track and it said, Yea, I love thee with an everlasting love. And I've drawn thee with loving kindness. God didn't threaten me that if I don't get saved, I'll burn in hell. He didn't, he didn't threaten me with prison. He didn't threaten me with all types of things. None of that. No, no. All God did was say, I love you. Yes. See, it's a blessing. Wonderful feeling to be loved. I mean, truly loved. Yes. I mean, God, see, you, you are truly loved when, when a person loves you and you don't have nothing to give back to them. Yes. You feel me this morning? Yes. You are truly loved when a person loves you and you have nothing to give back to them. Yes. See, a person might say, I love you and you love me back. And, you know, and I do this for you and you do that for me. But when I couldn't do nothing for God. When my mind was messed up, when my life was messed up, God loved me then. That's real love, say to God. Unconditional love. Love, my God, that has transpierced the ages and have reached from that cross down to this morning. And God loves me this morning, thank God. Nothing can separate from the love of God. I have learned that God loves us, say to God. Amen. Hey, let's turn on to Matthew 26 and 41. Those are two uh, foundation things that we had to hit this morning. That is the beginning of a relationship with God. One, realizing that the life of sin is a hard life. And two, realizing that God's love is so great that it will deliver you from the power of sin. That it will, that it will pull you out of the world. It will pull you out of addiction, thank God. It will pull you out of every habit. It will pull you out of any party, my God. It will pull you out of any prison, thank God. To know that God's love is that great. Those are the foundation pieces. One, yes, my life is messed up in sin. I have to admit it. I, I got to quit front. I got to quit putting on this facade. I got to quit saying I'm all right when I know I'm not all right. I got to humble my heart and say, God, I need you this morning. And two, I got to believe that God, you love me so much that even though, Lord, I've sinned against you a million times, Lord, I've got a record as long as a toilet paper roll, my God. I've done so many sins that you can't keep counting. 
count. But Lord, you love me. And based on the fact that you love me, Lord, I know you'll save me. And Lord, I know you'll deliver me, thank God. And once you've got that, then you can begin to build on these things we're about to talk about to have a successful life of salvation. Number one, I'm messed up. Number two, God loves me. He saves me. And now these next five points are five things that we must consider. Amen. That we must learn in order to be successful in our salvation. Sister Pam, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. That he enter not into temptation. That he enter not into temptation. But the spirit of the is willing. But the spirit of the is willing. But the flesh is weak. But the flesh is weak. It said, watch and pray. Uh -huh. That he enter not into temptation. Right. Mary, a good saint of God, has lost the battle, thrown in the town, and given up because they entered into temptation. I don't care whether you're going to say a day, a year, 10 years, 100 years. I don't care how spiritually strong you are this morning. I am in the mindset that you cannot knowingly enter into a temptation and not come out untouched. That's right. That's true. You cannot normally walk in a room that you know is full of sin, that is full of temptation, and come out untouched. The crack addict may feel like I've been delivered by the blood of God. I've been delivered by the blood of Christ, I mean. And I, I am so delivered, I have no desire for the crack pipe no more. Some of me say, I have no desire for a cigarette no more. But to normally go into a crack house and hang out. For the alcoholic to normally go and sit at a bar and everyone's drinking around you. You enter into temptation, my God. For us being that are visual, amen, to normally go to certain websites. Amen. Pick up certain books. Go to certain beaches. But all these half clad, my God, no clad women with everything just hanging out. They don't work. When you see a temptation, you need to go the other way. Isn't that right? Paul told Timothy, said, flee, run, get away from it, don't be around it, don't get near it, why? Because you're not that strong, but God got grace, yes he does, but you're not that strong, my God, only oh, God can help you, yes he can, but the Bible says, thou should not tempt the Lord thy God, when the devil tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus said, hold on, no, can you try to tempt me, but I'm not going to tempt God, the devil tried to pull you into a trap, you better stay away from it, my God. Too many people, they place themselves in harm's way. And they wonder why they get knocked down. They wonder why they get knocked out. Why? You put yourself in it. I remember when I got saved, I had a clean house. I had all types of foolishness in my closet. From alcoholic substances to CDs and tapes and books and this foolishness. That I knew if I was to hang on to those things, they would do nothing but pull me back. I knew if I was to keep those things, that in a moment of weakness, the devil would point me right to them. I know that if he found me with my guard down and I had not prayed and fasted and had my devotion, that he would remind me of what's in that closet. And I would find myself going back to the very So it's better, amen, to do what the Bible says and have, along with your faith to have a little works, amen. So many people want to get the juice out of the berry, but call themselves not eating the berry. Right. I just suck on the berry and get the juice. Right. No. Same thing. Oh, it's the same thing. Just like my little daughter. My, my, my daughter Andrew, many years ago, she was probably two years old. Wife and I had went out to eat. We came back. We had this chocolate brownie uh, with chocolate fudge all over it. Ice cream and all this stuff was all around. We was going to share that dessert. And my little daughter, she reached over with her finger. She just kind of dipped her finger and she tasted it. And she looked and she just reached and grabbed the whole thing. <laughs> and she had the whole brown gooey fudge all over in her head. And she began to put it to her mouth and said, no! Not my brownie. That's the same way. The devil will hold things in your face. He'll put them in your face and he'll, he'll swing it there. And you reach out and you just put your finger on it and get a taste. Before you know it, you're going to be grabbing the whole thing. Just like Eve in the garden. Once the devil had convinced her that it was good to eat, what did she 
do? She took from the tree and she ate. And she gave to Adam and her husband with her. He ate. And they was messed up and our whole world messed up because of that. Why? Eve entered into temptation. See, I'm going to tell you, look, she was wrong from the very start because she was talking to the devil. The moment you begin to start talking to the devil, you start entertaining what he's saying, you're already going down the wrong road. You've already opened the door to temptation, my God, and you got one foot in the room. You cannot enter into temptation and not come out. You may come out and say, well, I didn't sin, but the devil got his paw marks all over him. He got his fingerprints all over him, my God. And it may be with just the mercy of God that you got out alive, but you didn't get out untouched. You got out alive, but you, it was something in that conversation you had with that guy. It was something, it, it aroused something in you. When she said this, you felt a certain way. And you said, I'm going to call her back again. You should delete her number, delete his number from your phone all together. He said, well, I'm going to do that. Because if it ain't long, listen, you're human. You're natural. And that's why Jesus said here, let's read that again, Sister right. Pam. He said, uh, watch and pray. Watch and pray. That he entered not into the Yes, day. come on. The spirit indeed is All the your spirit is willing, thank God. You're willing to go all the way with God. You want to be saved. You want to do this and that. But what? But the flesh. But the flesh. Yeah. See, the flesh is weak, my God. And the flesh, it can't handle certain stimulations. Right. It can't handle certain situations, right. my God. It can't handle certain things. Right. If you put it there, it's going to cry out. And it's strong, my God. That's why Paul said, what, I have to keep it under my body. That's why I can't enter into certain places. I can't go certain places, do certain things. I feel like one time in years ago, me and some brothers were at the mall on a good hot day. We was going, Brother Bird, from store to store. We were looking at Dom's hats and we were looking at nice shoes. And you know, we was at the mall in Detroit there. And after a while, I know that we all was kind of walking with our head down. <laughs> And uh, we walked with our head down, and I kind of looked over the brother like this with my head down. And he looked over me with his head down. And I said, brother, I think it's time to leave. He said, I feel you. And we got on up out of the body. There was too much eye candy. There was too much to see. Women everywhere just put their stuff. See, today, women don't have, most women don't have no respect for their body. And they're going to put it all on display. But let's see, if you get a man that way, do you think, okay, that's how you got him. So what else will get him the same way? Right. Isn't that right? Yeah. And that's how you got him. And you stole him from his woman, my God, because right. you were showing a little more than she showed. But it's going to be another woman that showed more than you show, my God. Right. And as a brother, my God, a uh, uh, man of God, you ain't got no business being around folks like that. God help us, my God. I'm just telling you, I've learned some things. Brothers in the congregation, I've learned some things. If you want to stay safe, I say, Lord, put a blind over my eyes. Lord, put a watch over my eyes, amen. When they bend over, when they do this, let me look the other way. That's right. Look at my people bend. That's right. And as much grace as God got, I have no business entering into temptation. When you enter into temptation, you're going to come out. The devil's paw marks all. And the same thing applies to sisters. They're not as visual as we are. But it's a pretty strong, buff looking man out there. With good hair and ripped muscles and all of that. And they know how to run them lines. And they know, I'm talking about the girl, your legs must be tired. Well, why is it? Because you've been running through my mind all day long. All that stuff. All day. And then you let them, let, them, let them throw a few more lines. And that next thing you know, they got your phone number. And then they ask you out to dinner. And one thing, as we preached a few months ago, leads to another. And before we know it, we have an empty seat. But that's where Sister Cucumber used to sit. What happens? He entered into temptation. Saints of God, enter not. I've learned, God help me, God help us, to enter not into temptation. A few more things this morning. Let's turn this morning to James 4 and 7. Sister Pam. Sister Linda, 1 Peter 5 6. James 4 and 7. Submit yourselves. Submit yourselves. Therefore to God. Therefore to God. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Right. And 1 Peter 5 and 6 said. 5 and 6 says, This is he that came. First Peter. Peter. Oh, sorry, first John. I'm sorry. First Peter. I'm sorry, first Peter. 5 verse 6. Okay, I got you. Alright, first Peter 5. It says, humble. Humble. Your 
yourselves. Yourselves. Yes. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Amen. So the pen I just read, submit yourself. And so let me come right behind it and say, humble yourself. There's two things that we must possess in order to have an extended experience with God as honesty and humility. One, I've got to be honest and acknowledge before God that I need help. One of the most detrimental things that we could ever do is justify our wrongdoing. If you make a mistake, if you slip up, if you struggle and you falter and you fail and you fall flat on your face, do not make an excuse for it. Do not blame anybody else. And do not justify it and say, well, it's because I'm human. No, because you've been in a temptation. That's what it is. But the moment we begin to start justifying ourselves, we're in trouble. The best thing we can do is be honest and say, God, yeah, I did mess up. Like David. He went and he cried out and he said, God have mercy on me. Psalms 51, read it later, my God. He said, Lord, I've committed iniquity. Lord, I've messed up. I've sinned against you, my God. When, if you do, perchance that happened, don't justify it. Don't act like it ain't nothing. But get on your face before God and be honest and recognize I need help. And then be willing to submit and humble yourself to God. See, I have learned that salvation gets hard when we refuse to bring our will and our ways and our dreams and our desires and our ambitions in line with God's will and God's way and God's dreams and desires and ambitions for our life. We have what we call a head-on collision, my God. What I want to do what I want to do and God wants you to do what He wants you to do and so either you can both be going the same way but more likely most people are going to go against the grain and go against God and we're going to have a collision, my God. Salvation gets hard when your will goes against God's will. When you want to do what you want to do more than doing what God wants you to do. I've had times in my life where I thought that God was trying to break me. I've had to cry and many tears and I say, God, you love me and Lord, you saved me. Now why are you trying to destroy me? Lord, it seems like you, I remember even testifying one time. I got to say, my God trying to break me. Yes. And a little bit later on, God came and said, I am. Yes. I am trying to break you. I'm trying to break you because you are the problem. Yes. Our greatest enemy is not the devil. Contrary to popular belief. But the greatest enemy that you have is the one that you look at in the mirror every day. Amen, amen, and amen. When you look in the mirror and you see Brother Bobby, you see Brother Tomato, Sister Cucumber, that's your greatest enemy. That's the one that is going to try to stop you from succeeding in salvation. We have to take and submit and surrender and humble ourselves before God. We need to say, Lord, not what even Jesus had to do with it. And I can't think of anyone that's greater than him. And we were to go back to the chapter we just left, Matthew 26, it said he prayed in the garden. I think it wasn't once, it wasn't twice, but three times. He said, Father, if, if, if anything you can do for me right now, if you be willing, if you be possible, I don't want to drink this cup. Lord, I don't want to do this. But he said at the end, not my will. But Lord, I really want to go here. I really want to do this. I really want to be there. I really want to have him or have her. Lord, not my will. When I wanted to get married, I was a young man when I got saved. I've been saved four, five, six years. And I wasn't one of them brothers that walked around small. I want to be like Paul. I didn't I want to be like Peter. Y'all know the difference, right? Paul was never married. And Peter had a wife. Which, as the pastor would say, side note, since Peter had a wife, he couldn't have been the first pope because popes don't have wives, do they? Just a little doctrinal point. But I always wanted to be like Peter. I always wanted to be married. By the time I got saved, I wanted to be married. I was only 16. And the Lord said, not now, son. Then when I was 18, I got out of my own. I had got a house and a good job. I said, I'm ready to get married. The guy said, no, you ain't. I thought, you know, I got a job. I got my own place. I'm 
somebody to get married. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, ready to get married. But I was always the mindset, I wanted to be married. I want to have a family. I want to be a father. I mean, that was just a noble desire that I had. But I had to come to a point in my experience where I said, God, if I don't get married, that was hard, Saints. Oh, that was hard. I had been in a relationship that didn't go right. And I remember after that, I had came back to God and I said, God, I don't know why things ain't going right, but God, if I don't get married, if you choose to wait 10 years or never, I don't know, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, and I was a young man, what they say, for Murray in my prime. I was ready, I wanted to be married, I wanted to have a wife, I, I mean, just, my father died young, so I couldn't wait to have children so I could be a father. I just, I was ready. But all of those dreams, all of those desires and ambitions I had, I had to lay them on the altar. I had to lay everything on the altar. I had to be like that old Indian. Y'all remember the story of the Indian? They said he came and he laid his teepee on the altar. And he said, Lord, send a fire. The fire didn't come. He took out his tomahawk. He put his tomahawk on the altar. He said, Lord, send a fire. And the fire didn't come. He went and got the squaw, his child, and he put his child on the altar. He said, now surely, Lord, you'll send the fire. And the fire didn't come. And he said, Lord, what are I going to put on the altar? He said, you're going to put you on the altar. That's right. And when he got on that altar, That's right. the fire fell, thank God. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost and power, my God. Amen. If you want to succeed, I have learned that when we surrender all, the song says, I think, 511 in our song book, but it's the, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, thank God. All of my dreams, ambitions, desires, goals, my children, my job, my house, amen, God. If you don't want me to live in it, I have a nice house in Jackson. And God, if you don't want me to give up this house, I remember I left the Lincoln Fellowship meeting one time, and God began to move on my heart to get some things ready to make this move. And I said, Lord, I got a nice house. Nice neighborhood, by a golf course. Man, I got a good job, making good money. Tenure on my job. I mean, I have a position of a rank and authority and all of that. I had to leave it all behind. I had to leave it behind. Why? Because I wanted to be in God's will. I wanted to be, and see, now I've learned that that's not always easy. That's when you got to pray. That's when you got to fast a little bit. That's when you got to pull aside your pastor, ministry, get counsel. Those that you love and ask them to pray with you. You got to get before God, just like Jesus did. That's your Gethsemane, thank God. And you got to surrender. Say, Lord, not my will. Not my will. Even this morning, Sister Gloria was talking about a friend that she grew up with. I said, I don't have no friends I grew up with in Macon. They all in the skin. They all in Jackson. I said, I might never be able to stay there down here. A friend I grew up with, long But I said, Lord, not my will. This is my home now. Lord, this is where you want me to be. Lord, I'm in your will. And as I believe it was Corey Tim Boom said, the safest place on all the earth is in the center of God's will. You want to be in a safe place? Get smack down in the middle of God's will. And you are in a safe place. Surrender your life and give yourself to God and you'll be in a safe place, thank God. I learned, saints of God, that we have to humble ourselves and God will lift us up. Let's turn to Hebrews 5. And verse number 8. Three more points to cover. Amen. I'm praying that the Lord will help us. If we have not learned these things, then we will. Learn not to enter temptation. Learn to submit ourselves to God. Hebrews 5 and 8. Though he were a son. Though he were a son. Yet learned he obedience. Yet learned he obedience. Which he Thank God our trials are for a reason. God does not try you just for the fun of it. God does not try you just to get a kick out of things, you know, so you can, you know, get the angels and, and Jesus and all that. Say, look at him. He's going through. Isn't that funny? No, that's not how God works. Every time a trial comes to your door, every time an affliction comes to your body, every time you have adverse circumstances in your life, that's God working. It's God working in you. Maybe to work something out of you, thank God. Maybe to see just where you stand. Maybe to show you yourself. Even Abraham, when God tried him with his only son, Isaac, he said, go and sacrifice Isaac. But Lord, you said by him, 
I'm going to have the whole nation going to be born. Go sacrifice. Abraham said, all right, I'll do it. And he got to the point where he had the knife back and was about to do it. And God caught his hand. Caught him. He said, don't do it. He said, now I know. Now I know. He suffered some things. When we suffer some things, if we will be obedient to God, we can get through it a lot faster. One brother told me one time, he said, look, he said, I don't know what it is God is trying to teach me, but I want to hurry up and learn so I can get this trial over with. He said, because man, this thing is getting me. It was hard, it was long. See, in every trial that you have, there's something for you to learn. Yeah. Like I said, they're not just indiscriminate, but there's something God wants you to learn. Just like in school, you learn the material, they give you the book. Right. And you learn the lessons in school, and you got to take the test. Right. And if you fail the test, guess what? You got to take it over. Right. And if you fail it again, you got to take it over. And if you fail it a third time, you got to take it over. Until you, until you might be 15 years old in the fifth grade. Right. I mean, theoretically speaking, now, now we know how these schools that push people on through. Right. 15 years old, you can't even read uh, Mr. The, uh, ben, uh, Mr. Big Dance the Jig, or whatever. I mean, you can't even read 300 words. Like my son, they're, they're, they're reading, you know, cat, cat, ran after rat, or something like that. I mean, it's simple words. They didn't learn that. You know, but nowadays, people get pushed on through, and they can't read that. But God is not going to push you on through. God is not going to be like uh, whatever county board of education and push you on through the system. And, this, and then you get to be 18 years old and you ain't passed, not no test, no class, but they give you a diploma and say, go on about your life. Y'all don't do that. You're not, God is not just going to usher you on into heaven and you can fail with every trial you have. You can fail with every temptation you have, every test. God is not going to do that. He can keep his finger right there. And until you do what he's required you to do, you're going to be stuck in that place. You ever wonder why some saints have been around for a long time and it seems like they don't got no power, don't got no glory, don't got... Why? Because they're still in the third grade. Way back, maybe 10 years ago, they had a trial and they still haven't gone through that trial. They had a test and they keep flopping that test. Every time they come, they flop it in. And then God is merciful now. God will give you a little space grace. He'll hold it back for a while so you can supposedly build yourself up in the love of God and get before God and get some grace in your soul. And so when that trial comes to your door again, this time I got it. And then we get in that trial again and we flop again. And God said, I would love to pass you, but I cannot give you a passing mark until you pass this test. So Jesus has said that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, saints of God. If we want to stop repeating our tests and trials, let us learn from them. And let us get through them with victory. And we can move on to the next phase in life. Philippians 4 and 11. Philippians 4 and 11. Talking this morning about I have learned by experience. Life is all about learning. If we learn, who's it better for? We are. Isn't that right? If you learn from your trials, if you learn from your tests, if you learn from your mistakes, you're the better for it, thank God. And not only you the better for it, but that person that's following you is the better for it, thank God. Because you can tell them about the little traps. You can tell them about the little snags, the little bumps in the road. You can tell them, don't go that way. Why not? Because the devil's over there. But don't go that way. Why not? Because the failure's inside. But don't go that way. Why? Because you get discouraged. You can tell others. You can help others. My God, the Bible said, let the older teach the younger. You might say, well, I'm not old, but you might be old in the gospel. You been saved for 20 years. You got saved when you was nine. You're 29 now. You, be all, you ought to be able to teach some people some things. You ought to be able to pull some young people aside and so you can learn from me. Why? Because I've learned some things. Thank God. I've learned some things. Philippians 4 and verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want. Here we go again. But I have learned. And whatsoever state that I'm in, Thank God, that's a lesson that the church needs to learn today. Thank God, we got, my God, uh, we got too many church folks chasing after the world. They have yet to learn to be content. 
content with such things as I have. Yes. Lord, if I never get a better job. Lord, if I never have six figures in the bank. Yes. Lord, if I never drive a fancy car. Lord, none of that equals happiness in the yes. None of that equals. Now, granted, you want something reliable. Granted, you want something that's going to get you from A to B and sometimes C, thank God. It's all right. But when you begin to devote your life to things, I'm not even going to say what, just to things. You begin to devote your life to getting things. We in trouble. Paul said, I learned to be content. Lord, I'm content with your will for my life. The pastor back home often said, if you're not happy as you are, you will not be happy as you wish you were. If you have not learned to be happy in your current situation, if you have not learned to be happy in the, under the circumstances that God has you in, thank God. If you have not learned to be happy with the hand that God has dealt you in life right now, you will not be happy with the way you wish you could be, thank God. As they said so many times just in regards to marriage, they said you got single people wishing they were married and married people wishing they were single. Why? Because they didn't learn how to be happy the way they were, so now they're not happy the way they are, thank God. You feel me this morning, saints of God? You have to learn to be content where you are. Learn how to be happy where you are and what you have. And once you've done that, then God will open the floodgates and bless you with more, thank God. Say, he that is faithful a little, be faithful with a few things that you have. Be happy with the little that God has given you, and then God will give you more. But if you don't, you can't expect God to open up the floodgates and have him bless. Because he wants you to be happy in him. Amen. Paul, at different times, when you read your Bible, you see where Paul sometimes, he was doing well and affluent, things were going his way. But then you read other times where Paul was destitute, where he had nothing to eat. Nothing. He had nowhere to stay. Nowhere. He was down and out. But he still had a song. Still had a message to preach. Still had a genuine smile on his face. Paul had that. Why? Because he learned to be content. He learned to be happy in the life that God had given. Lord, whatever hand you deal me, I'm going to be happy with it, thank God. God has to help us all to learn to not learn. And learn to not complain. But learn to give God praise. God just for life. Lord, I'm not six feet under. I don't have a ton of dirt on top of me right now. Lord, I thank God that I can walk. We you hear about the man who's complaining about the fact that he had no shoes to get the man with no feet, but you know that story. He used to complain, I ain't got no shoes to wear. I ain't got no shoes. And one day he met a man with no feet. And then he would run around happy with no shoes. Man, I don't need no shoes. I got feet. Learn to be content, thank God. Be content knowing that God is in control of my life. Sister Lily was testifying, I told Lily, I said, that's out of my message this morning. When things spin out of control, when you have no control, when you lose your job, when you get the foreclosure notice, when you find out for some people that you're pregnant for the eighth time, oh, no, no, yeah. I'm thankful, amen. I'm thankful, I love my children, and I'm a boy. As God sees what to give us, thank God. Well, I learned to be content. Children are a blessing, thank God. But for some people, they look at it as a curse, and that's a sad, sad situation. But anyways, when you find out that, like I said, the board closure notice and the light, the heat's getting cut off, that's hard. Oh, it's hard. But God knew about it. When it happened, God knew about it. Why he allowed it to happen, only he knows. One person asked a question, but it's going to be now through the a theological question. They said, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen? And a lot of people have come up with a lot of answers. Well, because of this or because of that. You know, Job, he was a good man. Why did God let all that happen to Job? When they was asking the Jewish rabbi one day, they asked him, he said, why? He said, why do bad things happen to good people? He gave the best answer that I've ever heard. He said, no one knows. No one knows. Only God knows. Sometimes only God knows why he allows certain things to happen. And we have to commit that to God's trust, thanks to God. I have learned that when things go adversely, when things go wrong, when my world is turned upside down and the bottom falls out, that I got to 
trust God anyways. Yeah. Then I've got to trust that God is in control and that God knows what he's doing. And as the old song says, I'll understand it better. I am not. I may not understand it right now, but I'll understand it better by and by. Lord, why you allow this to happen to me? Lord, I did nothing but serve you and please you. And why is this happening? I don't know. And Brother Long don't know. And Brother Strozer don't know. The oldest brother in the church who's got many years of experience, even he don't know. But God knows. Oh, God knows. And we'll know. We may not know that we get there, but we'll know one day. He'll be glad we'll have all eternity to talk it over with him. I mean, and he'll be glad to sit down by your side and say, now you know, uh, Sister Benita, that happened because of this. And the reason why I allowed it because you needed this. And this, that, and the other, the other, the other. And you be like, Lord, I'm so glad. I didn't understand it then, but Lord, now I know. You read in the book of Job, you can turn there later to the last chapter. Job came to a point, and he said, I had heard by the hearing of the years, something, something. He said, but now I know. After 40 years of trial, his trial, they tell us, lasted 40 years. 40 years afflicted in his body. Lost his children, everything that he had, poverty, poor, everything was bad. But after 40 years later, he came back to God and said, Lord, now I know. Now I know. Now I, he said, now I know that what? Thou canst do all things. Let's turn there real quick, just, just so you know I'm not just talking. Let's turn in Proverbs, I mean, uh, Job. You got that, Sister Pam? Chapter 40, I believe. 42. <laughs> Amen. 42 2. 42 1. Then Job answered the Lord. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. I know that thou canst do everything. And that no thought, and that no thought can be withholding from thee. Thank God. Now I know. He said, I know that you can do anything. If I had never had a trial, if I had never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could fix it. Y'all know that song. If I was never sick, I would know that God could heal me. If I was never broke, I would know that God could bless me with some money, thank God. If I never had a situation or trial or tribulation, then I would know that God could bring me through. Yeah, I heard I'd brought to the other room. Bless God, since I still got through that trial. I heard I'd be brought the bottom of the room. I heard it. But if I haven't been through, I won't know what God can do, thank God. You have to sometimes go through yourself so that you can learn by experience, thank God. You can learn by experience that God is able. So I've learned, say to God, to be content knowing that God is in control. And to reiterate the last point about contentedness, I've learned, and I know now, that material success does not equal spiritual success. A lot of prosperity preachers, they preach that you give your life to God, God will bless you with a big house and a Cadillac, a big house and a BMW, bless you with a good job and lots of money. Well, if I'm basing my Christian experience off of Christ, I never read in the Bible where Jesus drove a Cadillac or a BMW. I never read in the Word of God where Jesus lived in a big house. Never read it. I never read where he had a bachelor's degree, not even a PhD. But Jesus was the most happy, blessed, spiritually victorious, wonderful, greatest man God has ever walked this planet, thank God. If you are waiting to get happy until you get something in life, you'll never be happy, my God. If you are waiting, thank God, until you get that car, that house, that man, that woman, you'll never happy, my God. If you think that material things make you happy, you are sadly mistaken, my God. You can be a broke joke without two nickels to rub together, my God, and have joy bubbling up on the inside, so much so that you can't keep it to yourself. You go around telling people, man, I'm so happy. They say, how can you be happy? You ain't got nothing because I got Jesus and I got everything, thank God. You can be happy in God. I've learned and I'm learning it now. As my whole life has changed since we moved south, I've learned a whole lot.
this 16 months since he died. And I learned and I learned how to give God praise in the good times and in the bad times. How to let God know that, Lord, I trust you. That you know what you're doing. Disappointments I've had many. Many disappointments. But someone said that a disappointment really is his appointment. You take out that D and you put an H. Disappointment turns into his appointment, thank God. So while you thought it was a disappointment, God made it his appointment to make you better, thank God. To make you stronger, my God. To help you grow in your faith and your walk with him. Disappointments are his appointments, praise God. God knows what he's doing. I've learned to trust him, amen. amen. Let's go ahead and wrap it up. Proverbs 24, 16. Sister Pam. And Sister Linda, Psalms 136.23. Proverbs 24, verse 16. We're talking about things that we've learned to make you spiritually successful. A lot of people have gotten saved, but they have not followed on to know the Lord. One time, a long time ago, Sister Green was quoting that scripture out of Hosea. And she said, follow on to know God. Give God a chance. Don't be so impatient when things don't happen right away and go your way. You know, we live in a fast-paced, high-demand society. I gotta have it, and I gotta have it when? Tomorrow. No, right now. I gotta have it right now. And when you get saved, you want this to work out, that to work out, this problem to go away, that problem to go away. And if it doesn't happen within a week or a month, you, you bail out on God. But if we follow on and know God and give God an opportunity to work in our lives, we'll be the better for us, thanks to God. We've got to stay with God long enough to learn some things. And too many people, they don't want to learn. I mean, we, we got too many saints that got ADD, ADHD, whatever you want to call it. But it can't sit still long enough with God. The Bible said, get before a guy who said, be still. That's what I'm looking for. Be still and know that I am God. Right. Too many of us can't be still. We, we get sick and we got to do something. We got to do something. And we do something that's wrong. And we find ourselves flat on our face. Or we find ourselves on the outside again looking in. But if we would just be still and we will wait on God and let God work in our life, we will be the better for it. Thank God. We got to learn some things again. As we reach this last point, we realize, all right, we'll go ahead and read the scripture, amen. This is the last point this morning of the things that we learned. Uh, Sister Pam, Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man falleth seven times. For a just man falleth seven times. And rises up again. And rises up again. So the wicked shall fall into mischief. Now we know that God is able to keep us from falling. Isn't that right? Yeah. But as much as we know that God is able, his, his ability is only good so long as you take his help. That's right. That's right. That's right. See, God has all power. And God has all glory. And he has the ability to save a man and keep a man. But this is that's God's part. God said, I'll save you and I'll keep you. I'll give you grace. I'll give you glory. I'll give you strength. I'll give you power. I'll give you deliverance. I'll give you everything that you need. But with all of that, your part and my part and our part is that we have to take God's help. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? We have to be willing to accept God's help. And the problem that we have when a just man falls or when someone makes a mistake or they get tangled up in sin again or they go back on God or whatever the case may be, it's because they preferred that over God. Yeah. They decided they would rather yield to the temptation than to take God's help. Yeah. That's just keeping it real. Yeah. But now here lies the great problem. I have learned that running solves nothing. I have learned that quitting is not the answer. I have learned that if you fall down, get up. I'd rather see you fall flat on your face and get up and run another day than to lay there and let the devil drag you through the muck and mire of sin and destroy your life and your soul for eternity, my God. 
I told you about the story of that uh, runner. He was running the Olympic race. Lord help me, I can't remember his name right now. But as he was running, he failed. He stumbled and he failed. And anyone knows anything about Olympics, if you watch those runners, they're moving fast. Uh -huh. Someone moving in what we call world record time. So if you fall, there's two or three other guys that they're going to pass you. They're going to they gonna pass you. And this man was running. He was doing well, maybe leading the pack, and he fell. And he was on the ground. And he knew that he lost the race because he failed. I mean, when you fall, there's no way you can get back up and, and catch up and win the race. And he laid there for a minute. He said, well, I'm going to get up anyways. And he got up, saints, and he started running. He didn't care the fact that people had passed him. He started running. And one by one, he passed that guy, and the next guy, and the next guy, and he crossed the finish line in a world record time. But what if he would have laid there? What if he would have gave up, my God? What if he would have said, I can't do it, and laid there and just said, I failed God, and I'll never be saved again, and I give up? My God, he got up, and he tried it one more time. He got up and he ran on to victory, thank God. I sometimes think back over my experience, I said, what if I gave up when I first time failed? Or second and third time had a, fa a failure, my God. I said, I never would have married my wife. I never would have been had these beautiful children. I never would have been called to the ministry, my God. I never would have been called to make it Jordan to be around the wonderful saints of God. I would be somewhere on the streets of Jackson, strung out on dope, my God. I, I might have been at, uh, on Cooper Street. That's where the big house is, the big prison in Jackson. I've been up there on Cooper Street, my God, maybe doing 10 to 20. I said, if I tell you, if I would gave up. See, too many saints, too many people, they've stumbled along the way and they fall. And instead of getting up and fighting another time, they throw in the towel. And today, I can run down the list of how many backsliders. If they just would have got up and tried it one more time. If they just would have got before God with honesty and humility and humble themselves, they could have lived and fought another day. They would have got the help they needed and they would have had that victory and many more under their belt. They would have had many titles, many crowns on their head, my God. But when they failed, they gave up. The Bible tells us a just man may fall seven times. That means he was a complete Fail seven means complete. Isn't that right? It means perfect. He was a perfect failure. You couldn't do nothing but fail. You stumbled over and over again, my God. But it said he rose up again. He rose up one more time. He threw one more punch, my God. And he knocked him out. Dear ones, I pray you never do have to fall. I pray you never do stumble or trip. But I want you to know that I've learned that if you do, Get up. Amen. Don't just lay there. Yes. Yes. One more story. Amen. In closing, we were in gym class back in 11th grade. And we were running around the gym in warm-ups, guys and girls alike. And there was a chair that would sit out there. And all the guys were running. They was hurling the chair. Anyone that, you know, know about track and field, you know, you hurl it. You jump over it. So everybody was jumping over it. And I run. And I go to hurl it around my foot catch. And man, I feel hard, oh, yeah. flat on my face. And for many minutes, I laid there. I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I mean, I'm red already, but I'm really red. <laughs> and I laid there on my face, and all the guys, my friends, and the girls. And, you know, you never want to fall in front of a girl if you're a guy. It's just embarrassing, you know. And I laid there for a long time. But Shante come around. One of my good friends, he played linebacker. He was big and strong. And he scooped me up. Got me on my feet. And he ran with me for a little while. He said, come on, man. Don't worry about that. And man, saints of God, I started running. And I forgot all about it. When the class was over, nobody said nothing to me about it. It was nothing. Jesus will do the same thing. He will come along and he will scoop you up. He will run with you, thank God. He'll get your front, your back, your side. He'll be with you. He'll help you. He'll bless you. He'll keep you. And he'll help you when you don't have to fall again, thank God. But you got to be willing to get up. Don't be like those folks that once they do fall to you, you, the saints call them and say, I don't want you to call. They go by and knock on your door, don't come to my house. 
I want nothing but I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Don't be like that. You sign your own death warrant. You seal your fate when you do that, my God. But as long as there's one drop of blood running through your veins, that says I want to be saved. That says I want to make it, my God. That says the rules read and the smoking flax, you will not quench that, God. God said as long as there's a desire in you that wants to be saved, I can work with it. Yes. What's the scripture saying, Psalm, sister? Psalm 136, 23.
But if you get that time and throw it in, uh -huh. you're tying God's hands. Sure. See, God can't force you. He can't make you, my God. But if you'll be willing and allow Him to help you, He will. As we stand this morning, these are some things, saints of God, that we have learned. We have learned by experience. If you need help this morning, we have an altar. If you need to pray and say, God, I have to learn how to submit my will to yours. So let's pray this morning. This morning, if you say, Lord, I need to learn obedience so I can get through this trial, then let's pray this morning. This morning, if you need to learn how to trust God for all things and be content with what he has given you in life, then let's pray this morning. This morning, if you fail, if you fail, you had a failure, let's pray that God can raise you up and can bless you. Saints of God this morning and, and, and friend in the audience, if you're not saved, most of all, if anyone needs to pray this morning, it's you. Yes. If you are not saved, the way of a transgressor is still very hard yes. and very difficult, my God. So this morning we'll take a verse of song. When the altar is open, we pray that you will come and pray. Amen, if you need to. So just hear what number do we have? Song number 504. Surrender this morning. Surrender all. 